Welcome to the Post Human Podcast. Today's guest, and this is a very special one to me, folks, uh, not only is he an author, <clears throat> excuse me, he's also an inventor, a podcast host, and he is the CEO and president of Berkeley Virotronic Systems, Scott Schober. Great to be on. No, thank you. I, I, I normally do a big introduction and I need to kind of put some sort of clapping system in there. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I should, I should, oh, I should have done it myself. Um, this is a very interesting one for me. I've not really spoke to anybody specifically about cybersecurity. Um, it's a very, very big issue in the world. Um, so let's just, before we get into the cybersecurity, again, you're a, a man of many paths. There's so yeah. many things. Um, we'll get a little bit to the inventions because they're very cool. Uh, it's very often that I get to meet someone that's invented something. Uh, and again, you have several inventions that are amazing. Um, I can't own them, but <laughs> they're a bit out of my, uh, well, I can't really get anything shipped in from America. It's a huge, costly thing. Uh, but let's talk first about your books. So you've got three books. Uh, obviously, Hacked Again, um, mm -hmm. Senior Cyber. Um, I could, there's another one. Um, I can't quite remember yeah. the name of that. Cyber Security is Everybody's Business. That's the, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. Uh, that, that's your most recent, I believe, isn't it? Uh, I did. Uh, Hacked Again was the initial book, and then Cyber Security is Everybody's Business, and then just recently, Senior Cyber. Senior. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, what made you do senior cybersecurity? Was it just to... Senior cyber was interesting because, and I kind of give you the backstory a little bit because initially um, I was talking about security. And again, our company almost 50 years old, providing security products, innovative solutions and things. So I'm always educating people, talking about problem and solution, how people could stay safe. And, and I found the more that I did that, the more I got a target on my back. And okay. what happened is hackers started to go after me. And, and it started simply as innocent, and probably all of us have dealt with this. You have a credit card, it's compromised, and then a debit card. That happened to me personally, then also in my company. And again, and again, and again, I get the card reissued. Something's not right. How could my cards get hacked and compromised so many times? Then my Twitter account was hacked. That was taken over. Uh, then we were rep receiving repeated DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks where our website is flooded. We do a fair amount of e-commerce, anywhere from you know twenty-five thousand upwards of maybe forty thousand a month. Sometimes just on our website, that's shut down. So now it's starting to really hurt and impact business, and a lot of other little things that I start to notice. And I investigated people that were hacking into my Twitter account, traced them all back to the dark web, and some of them were notorious hackers. But then one morning, <clears throat> I woke up, and it was sixty-five thousand U.S. dollars stolen out of our checking account, and I said, "This, this is." This has got to be a bigger problem. Something's wrong here. So it became a federal investigation, got law enforcement involved and so on and so forth. Anyway, all that happens. And I realized even, we're, even though we're a security company, we've been selling to, to mostly US DOD security agencies for many years. Um, You're still vulnerable you think we're yourself. secure? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of a wake up call. And in the process of that, I came off an interview and somebody uh, heard that our company was hacked. And I said, geez, they said, well, can I do a story on it? And I was like, I don't want to go on the record talking about here's a security company that gets yeah. compromised. We're like a bunch of buffoons. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I acquiesced as long as I could share my story, my misgivings, but also what I learned in the process so other people could stay secure. And then I got encouraged after that. And I said, the story's out. Why don't you write a book about it? It's an interesting story. So hence the uh, hacked again came out. And I guess I, I, I was kind of not being a writer, didn't really understand the process and what would happen, but it kind of took off. And even to this day, we, we made, uh, at the time we had a fun launch party. I made hacked again shirts. People years later are still walking around. I got a text the other week, two different texts, I should say, from somebody that I know. They were down in Florida and they said, hey, someone was wearing your hacked again shirt. <laughs> Just walk in the streets. And I was like, no way. And he goes, yeah, I yelled out the, the window and a nice shirt. And the guy yelled back, hey, great book. And then the guy no, yelled back, hey, I know the author. So it starts interesting conversations sometimes 
um, once you do write a book. But but that really got me more into writing. And then what writing got me into is helping me see back then, this was 2016, I guess, that the Hacked Again was released. It was a niche more targeted attack with with hacking that's changed over the last few years we at least in america we all think about the target hack that was 2013 to 14 that was kind yep. of the starting point i was really doing a lot of interviews talking a lot about cybersecurity. And most people look at me like kind of deer in a headlight uh, what are you talking about i don't understand these acronyms and terms and yeah. i'm a little <laughs> out there mister then a lot of jargon more, yeah exactly it started going more mainstream and I realized this is, you know, cybersecurity has changed from a very targeted attack to certain individuals or companies. Now it's something that we're all talking about, whether we like it or not. We're talking about stupid passwords and how to keep our information safe. Now cybersecurity has become everybody's business. And then I had that moment. I said, geez, I should write a book on it. And, and hence I did focused on that. Brought my brother in to partner with me. My brother's more on the creative side. He does the video editing and 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 all kinds of okay. stuff, sound. And, and he's really... Uh, awesome in that area the creative aspects bringing that together with me helped me write the second book much quicker and then also growing having your brother as a partner in the business yeah, yeah. growing up as a brother he's kind of the other half of my brain he kind of knows how i think a little bit and vice versa which really lends to the story i think it makes it more interesting um and then what happened is is i started dealing with my parents they've got aging health and my my grandfather at the time was 99 his health failing and all into technology, computer. That's a good year, though, you know. <laughs> Ninety nine. But I, I found every every waking moment, weekend, I'm there trying to help reset passwords, configure this. And myself and my brother were constantly buried trying to support my parents and, and aged grandfather. Um, how to work basic technology, and and a lot of times we'd sit there and they're like, "Why do I have to do this? This is so stupid. All these passwords, and they're writing them on sticky notes and using the reusing the same password. All the things you shouldn't do." So I'm trying to explain to them, and they're like, "There's got to be a better way." So I said, "You know what? There's, there's got to be something. Instead of spending all my time, let me see if there's a good video. Couldn't find one. Maybe there's a good book. I looked around. I couldn't find a really good focus book." that spoke to the senior audience and didn't yeah, make yeah. them feel kind of unless it was you know, like one of those for dummies kind of books that you just find out any subjects you know they've got one you know i'm yeah, sure they exactly you know yeah so, so i couldn't find anything i said that's it skip it. i'm gonna write one that's directed right toward the senior audience i'm gonna make that font big and bold um so they could see it and i'm gonna relate it with illustrations from their generation and their time period okay. so they can really make that connection as as the audience and hence they they uh they started to embrace it and the funny thing is all the comments i got back right in the beginning from seniors specifically is thank you i finally have a book that i have the font and i have to put on my special glasses or a magnifying glass and so it was kind of interesting and then in the process when i was going to print it they said, no, Scott, that font's too big. I was going to say, did you, get, not... did, did you get some yeah. kickback, kickback oh, for that, yeah. which I would have guessed you would have? Um, People were saying, you can't do that. And I said, I can do anything I want. Why not? It's your book. It's not for me. It's for, <laughs> for the reader. And it was funny. Again and again, a lot of people in the world of books and publishing would kind of push back. And when they would look at the manuscript and the font and they'd say, no, that's not how it's done. And I said, well, I said, I'm not focusing on doing this to make money and become a millionaire and this yeah, and yeah. that. Best stuff. I'm doing this to help educate. And if I'm going to educate my audience, I'm going to use every tool in my power to make it easy for them to embrace it. And, and hence went down that. And I'm glad I did. And I kind of stuck to my guns against what everybody said. And then in addition, we created actually a, an activity workbook for seniors. And it's got large pictures and word search and coloring and everything else. We created a special package of crayons that goes with that. And those are giveaways just yeah, to yeah. thank people for taking time to look at it. If I speak on the subject with senior cyber, I'll usually give that out to the audiences, share that with seniors or go to a assisted living homes or other well, places. See, there, seniors so. and word searches go hand in hand. That's oh, probably one of the, that's probably one of the yeah. easiest, you know, methods to just to be able to get anything across. But obviously then they need to know that sort of back information. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't just do a word search or a crossword where they go, well, who was uh, the first, who's just recently gone into space? You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know any of that, you know, poor example there. Um, yeah, but it works well, I think. And I think what it does is in the most of the time, it opens up the conversation and breaks the ice. Cause some people uh, still to this day, they hear cybersecurity, and if they are a senior, they kind of do this. They go, ooh, yeah, that, that's a very daunting that word. Boring, technical, and I try to instead twist it the other way. 
make it fun, storytelling, and simple explanations for best practice. And it's not about going out and spending a lot of money. It's just understanding why you need to create a long password, why you shouldn't reuse the same password across multiple login sites, but explaining it so they can get it or embracing yeah, yeah. technology. Maybe it's not getting the latest and greatest smartphone, but finding something else in between that they could still feel comfortable and operate, not feel intimidated, and then kind of stir up the emotions, how they felt decades back when they got their first rotary phone on the wall, <laughs> what those type of, they were, that was cutting edge back then yeah, in the yeah. days. And how they felt, it's the same thing now when they embrace technology, just so they don't feel intimidated. And, and I think it, at least it allows them to identify with the book and then dive in and read it. And I've, I've got some great feedback so far from my, my senior readers and then even caregivers. A lot of times caregivers, they were the similar place that I was. They're saying, geez, you know, I'm constantly going to moms or dads yeah, or well, grandpas trying to help them with this. Here would be a nice little that's gift. Not, that's me... not their job though. You know, they've got very yeah, little information yeah. about that. Their job to, to care and look after people, looking after their phone and cyber security. That's complete, you know, that's, it's impossible out of, the, out of the realm <clears throat> yeah yeah completely you know if uh you was working in a care home and one of my smart home and they got hacked for some of their life savings there's very little that you could possibly really do about it yeah. from the from being the managers of the care home it's you know it's like well you're kind of a bit responsible yourself there aren't you in terms of the citizen which sure. that's not really fair I'm sure that probably happens as well um my mum got hacked several years ago it was foolishly enough it was one of those weird, like, well, the, the person was claiming to be a member of the uh, European Union doing some stuff overseas um, back when, I think it was about 2014. So, yeah, it probably was about the same time. But he was claiming to be work for the, you know, World Health Organization and stuff like that. And just saying that it was trapped in dealing with a crisis and he needed some uh, money to pay for a flight back. And so, you know, and obviously that spiraled to several thousand. Uh, I didn't know anything about this at the time, which kind of sucked for me because she didn't tell me. And I'd have at least gave us, you know, let me have a little look at this guy. Yeah, but no. but and I think the key so thing easy. You just mentioned there, when, when anybody tries to hack or scam, they try to play on people's innocence. And if they're a little bit naive, they're a little bit trusting. And those are great qualities to have for, for people and, and tend to be people a little bit older than a certain generation. I think my generation, I feel oftentimes, or my, my kids even, they're like, I don't trust anyone. Yeah, yeah. They, they say. Um, seniors tend to be a little bit more trusting and, and open and honest. And they're also used to conversing. So if they get a phone call, and I share this in the, in the book, Senior Cyber, if they get a phone call, they grew up knowing that, that that one phone on the wall, you answered it respectfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say, hello, it's the Schober home. May I help you or something like that? My kids, the, the home phone rings. No one answers. <laughs> voicemail. Everybody's using a smartphone these days. I don't even know why we have a home phone. Kids don't, don't even leave it. voicemails either. Yeah, yeah. There's no such thing. Kind of change culturally. And I think cyber criminals know that. They prey on innocence. They prey on trust. They, they prey on tradition of people. And they use that to their advantage. And sometimes they'll also socially engineer someone. So if they're calling someone older, they're going to use familiar terms. Right, they're going to yeah, kind yeah. of use a fast conversation. Somebody maybe older, it'll take them a minute to catch up and they're thinking it out, but they're kind of giving that sense of urgency. And I always tell everybody, if there's ever a sense of urgency associated to any phone call, uh, anything where it almost seems right on the borderline scamish, stop. Ask that party for some information. Say, hold on, before you go, I, I don't, in case this connection drops, what was your name again? What's your phone number? And yeah, oftentimes yeah. the scammer hangs up quickly. So. I always get that information. Anyone ever yeah. phones me, I'm like, who am I talking to, by yeah. the way? By yeah. the way yeah. Cool, well, just to be on the safe side. It's, yeah. There's no harm in asking for it. On them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it's strange. Um, I mean, it's never happened to me. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe about a month, my uh, partner, she had a bank account opened up in her name, which was very, very odd. I mean, she's she's not all that unsecure, you know, cybersecurity at all. Um, she doesn't use like a VPN or anything like that. And there's there's been odd moments, but problem is she's like, oh, clickbait and do 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 do. You know, she'll, you know, do you know do you know when you log on to a website and they're like, would you like us to send you notifications? Some people mistake that for the cookies thing and just go bang, 
And next Jesus. thing, yeah. And next thing, she's getting notifications from millions of websites. Like, they're <clears throat> not really relevant either to what she's doing. Yeah. yeah but I, I said in... Oh, sorry, I said in doing so, that's probably how you, you, you know, your bank account has been, you know, they set one up in a name, which was so bizarre because the card come to here, come to the address and it's like, oh, you're lucky that didn't get intercepted. Otherwise, you'd have been doomed. Yeah. And, and I think what, what's good to do with certain things, what, basic precautions, at least what we're doing here in the States is freeze your credit. Um, I've even contacted my bank and, and told them and set limits. I said, hey, I don't want ever to have a wire transfer, a business account, a wire transfer ever to go out of our business unless it's myself there personally to sign for it yeah, yeah. and prove who I am. And it sounds kind of, you know, tedious not, not and a pain. <laughs> it is a bit tedious. It isn't. It's more convenient <laughs> online to just go online banking and, and shoot a wire transfer yeah, out. Yeah. But instead, I have to hop into the car. I drive down to my local branch. I say, hey, how you doing? Sit down with a little form, sign it. Ten minutes, I'm in and out. The difference is I have peace of mind that nobody's going oh, yes. to get in there and try to take money out again out of my account or impersonate I me mean, or things like that. So basic what, precautions. What's it worth spending? I don't know, let's say you do three transactions, maybe a week that you have to sign off for. Maybe that's a bit too extreme. Let's say two. You know, what's that in time? A couple of hours each day in its worst case scenario will you compare that to losing let's say five years worth of work oh yeah and funds what's really worth it you know it all adds up yep yeah and i always i always tell people when i'm especially when i'm speaking there's a balanced decision process just in our lives as consumers or business owners choosing convenience versus security yeah. <laughs> uh, if we take a little bit more easy. time and choose security and have layers of security it slows cyber thieves down from getting into our personal accounts, compromising us as a consumer or our small business, whatever, um, and use that layered approach. And I liken that often to our homes. If we're going to protect our homes, we're probably not just going to leave our front door open. No. We're going to have a lock. Maybe we're going to have a deadbolt. Dead we might have alarm cameras. cameras. Alarms, yeah, yeah. yeah all, all that stuff. Layers of security deter the thief so they move on to the next place to go rob somebody else. Same thing in cybersecurity. Well, I mean... You, the problem with modern day technology is the more advanced it gets, sometimes the more easy it is to hack. You know, exactly. there was a yeah. lot of um, people just hacking in through like wireless cameras and ring doorbells and, yes. you know, not so much quite now. But when there was first coming out, a lot of people were just getting hacked through just simple, uh, just almost like a WPS, you know, just... I don't know what the full... You know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a huge academic. I'm, I only just get bits of information and I'm sort of I'm a conduit of it in, in some sort of sense um but you know a lot a lot of it people have lots of smart light bulbs and it's a pretty there's not a lot of technology that's all that's even sophisticated to protect that you know it's like these are internet of things and there's billions and billions of devices um security was not designed at the onset and therefore it's not easy to upgrade it and change it when the vulnerability is discovered it's hard to get in there and change you're not going to unscrew your light bulb and try to update it and say oh okay there's there's something wrong in, in the stack protocol and bluetooth low energy let me update this so my light bulbs are secure no no one's even thinking about that but, but hackers are hackers yeah. realize that the bluetooth bluetooth low energy wi-fi cell phones anything wireless that's a conduit to hack into well, someone's home. The more smart devices you have, the more exactly. the more compromised yeah. it can become. You know, if you've got one yeah. system and it all runs into there, and mm -hmm. let's just say you know you've just got your PC, some really good, you know, uh, anti good anti software, anti malware, whatever, and that's all you use all day. Or you've got like a house that's got four kids, they've all got iPads, and then they've all got phones, and well, let's say we're all running light bulbs, and well, there's like eight bulbs minimum. You know, then they've probably got some, uh, like me, well, I have got one. It's a, uh, you know, like a Nest thermostat. Well, that's, you can still get into that. And it just, you know, there must be about 20 or 30 access points that you can just get into rather than, let's just say, the one or the two. So and people don't quite realize that. No, and, that's, and that's true of our, our smart homes. What, what's coming up now? Smart cars. Yeah. Smart cities. So so we as people are are too open and inviting in technology into our lives and, and all of us want to plug into the internet too fast without thinking about the possible security consequences down the road 
And, and that's, that's a fundamental problem. It's a human problem, but it's also a human solution. We can control how secure our digital footprint will be or not based upon what we do. Cars are becoming very simple to, to hack. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not a car thief, but I've seen plenty. There was a very notorious guy. I can't remember his name, but he used to just have this weird system that he created and he could go up to any car and within 60 seconds, boom, he's in it and driving away. I think he was from he was from the UK. He was from Essex or somewhere like that. Um, very notorious. And like several companies, I think Mercedes challenged him to one point to say, well, you know, let's see if you can get into this. And lo and behold, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's almost, you know, it was like an invite. Really? You want, you want to try it? OK, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about cars, what are cars? They're like our houses. Cars have, for the most part, you have RFID. Yep. Right. You, you, you're going to have some type of wireless focused, uh, you know, 400 megahertz or whatever on your remote key fob to get in to open and unlock the car. There's you're probably going to have, well, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots in cars nowadays. There's certainly Bluetooth in cars nowadays. So there's enough conduits to get in. If they don't plug right into the CAN bus, you know, and then manually plug in and hack it. There's a lot of wireless ways to get in there. And then throughout a car, you have in some cases upwards of 100 uh, processors, independent <laughs> control units now you can focus in on those once you get into one they're all interconnected now you just work laterally to find what you want to actually yeah, yeah, try yeah. to to hack into so it's not super easy but somebody that's technical and has ability they can do it and even even worse you can go on the dark web now and there's a lot of videos there's toolkits there's software there's hardware you can buy these things and you could become a, a cyber criminal overnight so it's really scary what's going on out there well, it was so scary when um, Silk Road, obviously when that yeah. first come out, um, you know, I've watched a few documentaries on it and obviously I think it's, oh, how old is that now? That's got to be about five-ish years old, maybe, maybe yeah, a bit more than that. I think the first, yeah. I, did a, I did an interview on that, on Silk Road on, on Bloomberg, and I think it was around 2014, 2015, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and I think it is fascinating and, and it opens your eyes up to, to understanding that there is a dark web that that resides. Not all people on the dark web are necessarily doing bad stuff, but oh, it, no. there is a lot of people that are bad. And, and oftentimes they're using cryptocurrency, primarily or predominantly Bitcoin, which is you know digital well, currency. What I was going to say as well is I, I remember a lot of stuff around the Silk Road point when yeah. I think it was when Bitcoin did their second little big leap. Mm -hmm. And at first, you know, cause I, me and one of my friends was talking about it at the time. It was, well, should we get into that Bitcoin? It's pretty, it was when it was just a bit lower. I think it was around like 100 or something like that. It was pretty low. It was pretty low. I can't remember the, what it was at, but it was it was low. And we was like, should we just put some money together, go in on it? And uh, fortunately, we never did. But yeah. it was uh, one, of those, one of those regrettable decisions. Um, yeah. Just, yeah, but who would have figured, I think, and especially when you compare it to all the thousands and thousands of different cryptocurrencies now it, it's amazing yeah nowadays in hindsight you look back and you say wow bitcoin not only did it take off and and billions of dollars have been um i guess come out of nothing and and that much has been lost i think more than half the bitcoins have actually been lost because of yeah, lost yeah. passwords addresses and things too so it's kind of a good and bad story it depends who you talk to yeah well i i'm a somewhat fan of alex jones and he claims that he lost years ago some ridiculous amount of yeah, coins wow. that was given to him something like 100 million 400 oh. million coins were some <laughs> preposterous amount but you don't know if, you know you don't have to believe that or not yeah, is it true you or know not? Yeah, I, but there's, had there has been people though yeah. yeah somebody was trying to pay me in coins one time years back and i'm thinking oh wow, man, now i look back and say oh but yeah. Could have been playing golf now. Could That's have. Uh... Right. Have a big conversation with you. <laughs> well, you still could. Some people uh, choose yeah. to just retire, but some people just go. Well, I don't really need the money. It's about the work. Yeah. <clears throat> What's your thoughts on? Um crypto i mean that's a weird sort of cyber security you know blockchain in itself very advanced you know we're now yeah. sort of coming into like you know well, like me, quantum I, I mean, like I, stuff I love as well technology i'm excited about blockchain blockchain uses are are so widespread and it affects so many different verticals i think it is in a sense it can kind of be a game changer but uh, it, it's very broad to say something like that. But when you look at some of the specific use cases of blockchain, how it can improve efficiency. And you, I think of something like 
production, logistics, and other things. You can apply blockchain in so many different areas that it really will be a big game changer. I think too many people kind of kind of pigeonhole blockchain into a very uh, a, a narrow thought and they associate it to cryptocurrency only. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, it's a good use for it. It's an effective use. It makes sense and works really well, but it's not really only solely designed to work there really well. It's, it, it's so many other practical uses and it does work really well with cryptocurrency also. I think that the stigma with Bitcoin is that it's just used for so many illicit purposes for buying and selling things that Bitcoin's got that bad rap to it, but it also makes it kind of mysterious, which makes people, ooh, let me learn yeah. about this. And, and it's extreme volatility obviously gets the day traders attention right away. So it's got three or four things going to it that makes it kind of exciting, cutting edge. You dip your toe into Bitcoin today and it's, you know, 30,000 tomorrow, might be 50,000 or it could be 10,000. You don't know. And you take a bath on it. So yeah. I, I personally, I try to avoid Bitcoin. I love learning everything and anything about it because it parallels the cybersecurity industry so much. I just don't use it as a means because I, I, I kind of understand it. And I also understand it's, it's really hard to explain to another person yeah, no. any intrinsic value. If they can't see the intrinsic value of it, it can somewhat be manipulated, which I think it is. And that's- Oh no, I believe it is. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, it's not just, it, it, it's, it, there, there are people out there that can manipulate it. And I think it's a level worse than maybe the stock market. The stock market- Oh you, yeah, you, that's you, regulated. Yeah, it's regulated. There's insurances. Wow. There's <laughs> and look, it still looks what look what happens in the stock market. People lose money every yeah, single yeah. day, so um, it, it can be difficult. And one of the one of the chapters in my book, I think it's hacked again. I call it cash in the mattress. In, in that we're becoming such a, a technical society and so dependent upon um, wireless communications and high tech things, and, and sometimes just good old cash in the mattress, like yeah, old yeah. school people used to do. Is actually going to be more safe and secure so one of my um friends uncles he used to just hide money behind pictures like he'd yes. put like a couple of <laughs> couple of 50 pound notes behind a picture yeah. mm -hmm. and he'd, but there'd be li little notes stashed all around his house like in just yeah. really random just like behind pictures he wouldn't go and like bury it in a bag in his garden but That's you know you, so yeah you know like mm -hmm. under his tv and things like that have a big huge i mean you know, he was in his 70s ish, yeah. uh, but he had, you know, one of the old big TVs that must have been about 40 inches, but it was a wow. big, a big back one. Yeah. Um, and he used to have money under there, but he couldn't get it out because he, yeah. he couldn't lift yeah. it anymore. <laughs> but, but it's so, you know, imagine that's a, that's the perfect bank for yourself, isn't it? You know, you, like, exactly. you put it under something and uh, 10 years later, it doesn't gain no interest, but you can't, you can't draw it. <laughs> well kind of gains get interest from a bank now either so maybe it's, it's yeah yeah <clears throat> well it depends how you look at it i mean if you if you if it was there if you worked out into currency and maybe traded it into euros and thought if you thought about it at the time and was like mm, oh this is my old holiday fund in euros i'll put this under the tv just in my head and then come to the modern dangle the euros jumped up i might get this back out now yeah. Even though there's no relevance of whatsoever, <laughs> it's still worth the exact same pound, but you can convince yourself, you know, that it's, yeah. uh, so let's talk a little bit about your inventions. Cause yeah. one of those, uh, again, this is, you know, I'm not sure whether even my partner could have been her bank card could have been, you know, copied as such. Um, but one, one of your inventions is called the skim scam. Yeah. Um, which is for ATMs uh, and it's to see if the skimmers, which is an absolutely perfect thing because there's tons in my neighborhood. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, and, and it's interesting because it, it, when we learn quickly, it's a global problem, first of all. It's not just isolated to any one particular area. Anywhere where there's ATM money machines where you would actually stick your, your card in to, to pull money out, there's a chance that that cyber criminals are there before you putting a skimmer. And there's a lot of different types of skimmers. They put skimmers down the neck. And, and really all a skimmer is, is a second magnetic read head. Yep. It reads the magnetic stripe on the bottom of our cards. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the, the, from a global scene, probably the United States is the, the furthest behind everybody in technology, which is kind of embarrassing because oh, really? there's still, there are credit card readers and debit card readers in the U.S. still that just look at the mag stripe only. 
Huh. Most other countries have migrated away from that and they're doing chip and pin, yeah, um, near field communication. We are slowly catching up. And a lot of it has to do with looking back and you follow the money trail. It's, it's the petroleum industry. If it's at a gas station, it's the banking industry, the financial community, the cost to upgrade the stuff is, is fairly sizable. And instead they're using the, the losses and credit card fraud and just raising the interest rates that, you, that consumers right. pay. Right. And they figure out, push the problem to the consumers. It's a lot easier than trying to regulate this and implement security. That's starting to change because now cybercrime in the U.S., especially around skimmers, is a multi-billion dollar business. In other words, the cyber criminals in many countries, there's Russian cyber criminal gangs and others, have targeted the U.S. because they said, geez, security is a little lax here. Let's make our attempt focused here and steal all the money we can while we can before they implement more layers of security. Um, and what our product simply does is it literally is a, is a go, no go. You, you slide this down, the board down, and it's attached to a little handheld uh, fob and it lights up green. If there's, if it's safe and there's no skimmer, it lights up red and it beeps at you if there's a, a skimmer placed in there. So a lot of banks we've sold them to and each teller will get them and they'll take turns going out and, you know, morning and before the bank closes, they'll just simply check and make sure nobody slipped in a quick skimmer because it only takes less I than think, a minute maybe i think that's every it. business should have one i think yeah i mean not that they should be responsible but obviously there's like convenience stores that have atms mm -hmm. built into the wall over here um yeah. and i don't know who's who has to physically look after that machine but when the um when the owner or proprietor moves out the the, the nine times out of ten the machine closes down anyway yeah. So it's kind of strange. So I'd almost assume that it would be the shopkeeper owner that would have to maintain it or pay sort of maybe to rent it out. I don't know. Some, sometimes you yeah. can charge. Sometimes they charge as well. So it's like a 50p, one pound mm -hmm. fee for withdrawing your money. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that those are the like nine times out of 10, they're always the machines that are always, you know, you look at it and you can sort of see that the the, the reader's already smashed into pieces. You know, it's all yeah. cracked and you go, I'm, yeah, you, I'm, I'm just looking and go, oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll go inside and do, ca you know, I'll do yeah. cash back. <laughs> actually good advice, what you said right there. If you notice anything does look a little off, if you notice on the machine, it, 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 it's a little older, maybe the bezel looks tampered or moved a yeah, little yeah. bit. Something's just not right good chance there's there's a skimmer down in the neck of that now there's another thing to keep in mind what, what a lot of the the cyber criminals have done is they've avoided putting a skimmer in there completely that th that you could see from the outside in a plastic bezel or something like that and what they've done is they've gone into the top of the machine many of the atm machines by manufacturer have generic keys to open the top to simply change the paper out the safe is down below different key different system it would take about three hours just to drill a pinhole in it with a carbide bit those safes are really solid, big, yeah, heavy, yeah, and that's yeah. what that the vault holds the money. But the top of the machine is not that secure. A simple key in the back, if you could either access it from behind, or often they're just little independent kiosks that are, like you said, sitting there in a yeah. store. You get behind it, pop that open where they're going to change the paper. You can place a Bluetooth skimmer, which is a skimmer attached to a Bluetooth module, a little pick chip that's got memory in it. And that you could then plug into the standard connector in the top of the POS where the card goes yep. in, close the machine back up and run. Now you've placed the skimmer inside the machine. Nobody sees it from the outside. They're not looking at bezels and things like that. But every time that card goes in, that second head reads your card number, your CVV data on the credit card mag stripe, and it puts it into a database. You get within 75 foot proximity of the machine with a little laptop make that Bluetooth yep. connection, download those hundreds and hundreds of stolen cards. And then in addition to that, they typically will take a pinhole camera and they'll discreetly hide that somewhere at an angle where you can't see it. And then they could see when you enter in your, your pin, your yeah, ID seen, to access I've, it. I've seen years ago, that was the way they used to do it was they used yeah. to have a rubbish old skimmer and then a tiny yeah, little exactly. camera and then they'd get the pin and then they'd do it that way. But uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like, like technology and like espionage and stuff like that because it's just so intriguing and i recently yeah. watched that uh new netflix series that's spycraft and there was talk there was talking um on that that basically they was using like bluetooth advancements mm -hmm. to just send send messages so they'd have something in a rock then they'd have a car pull up then they'd transmit it through the car and then they'd have someone walking over the other side of the street and they'd just transfer it um 
and you know you, there's no different you know you could put all that into a machine bugger off for a couple of days come back and just do your normal shopping then go oh, well you know what's this on my phone oh i've got a message do, 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 do. see you later <laughs> like people don't realize it's just so so simple you know yeah. i think that's how how cyber criminals work effectively now i always relate it to old days somebody wants to rob a bank they got a gun they got a mask yeah you know, they break in they got a getaway car outside those are all tells to catch the robber they see them they hear their voice they get caught on camera someone sees their license plate fingerprints left there's a lot of ways they can get caught now cyber crime it's different you could place technology as we talked about inside the atm never go back to that atm but every day yeah. you're getting hundreds and hundreds of stolen cards you can go on the dark web and you could remotely hack into a company and you could steal credentials, personal information, wire transfer fraud. You can do so many different things, steal this information. You never see the victim. So it's kind of a victimless crime. There's not that emotional attachment yeah, to it. Yeah. And there's anonymity. We're using, you know, or let's say not we're, the criminals are using Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. digital anonymous currency, the dark web. That, you know, you, you can't trace somebody back and find the IP address because it looks like they're in India. Oh, no, wait, they're in the UK. No, wait, they're in the US. It's hard to trace people down. The data is encrypted. So they can be in their pajamas in the basement, hacking away. No one's going to catch them or unlikely that someone's going to catch them. So one of the, difficult. sorry, one of the funny ones I found was people used to take like the chip and pin machines, which obviously, yeah. But you could just get a portable one of those mm -hmm. for, for businesses and people just used to put them in their pocket or their jacket yeah. and then just, you know, stand next to people on trains and then beep, you know, there was a, <clears throat> again, I can't remember the documentary, but there was, I seen it on there and the, a guy had, had it in a jacket, a jacket pocket. And every time he'd feel like a little vibration he'd just press the green enter key and he'd just have a preloaded set up amount, just going through the subway, boom, boom, boom. You know, 20 minute journey, he's had something like $12,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like just consistent little bits where people wouldn't even really, you know, most people didn't even realize because it was like 60, you know, I think it was something like $16 or some, some stupid low amount, you know, it wasn't aiming high, but just the volume of just going doot, 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 just by everybody. Yeah. And it's I think, so I think easy. Cyber thieves realize if they, they keep the, the theft to a low amount in certain cases and, and go after volume. Who's going yeah, to chase them down? No one's got fly, to Flying below the radar as well, isn't it? You know? Yeah, exactly. It's like the, it's like the, uh, the catch me if you can dude. Uh, what was his name? Uh, can't remember his name now. Summit. Uh, oh, this is, uh, um, I think I got to... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Abernathy. Uh, Frank Abagnale. Here it is. Frank Abagnale. Yeah, yeah. Good book. Yes. Yeah, Actually, yeah. He, he, um, I've met him before. And we chatted before down in uh, Washington, D.C. Wow. He actually wrote some uh, praise for my second book, uh, Cybersecurity is Everybody's wow. Business, on the back cover of it. Um, he, he gave me some praise. Really nice guy. And he's written some great books. And what a great storyteller. Um, I mean, the movie was awesome. I love the movie. It had Leonardo DiCaprio yeah, in yeah. it. But, but it's really, truly based upon Frank's Yeah, yeah. I've read, story. I prefer the book. The book's yeah. amazing. Yeah, really, really good stuff. And uh, I always encourage people to read it because it does open your mind up to things. And that I, I call him kind of a master of, of social engineering. Yeah. He really has that gift to be able to talk his way into a situation. If he's going to be an airline pilot or a lawyer or whatever, he uses those familiar terms that kind of break down any any hesitation somebody has and talks his way right through the through the door or whatever he's trying to accomplish. And I think it's pretty amazing what you can do with social engineering. Another um, uh, a great, uh, somebody that's gifted with that is Kevin Mitnick. He's, I guess, coined the world's most famous hacker. Uh, oh, if you've yeah, ever yeah. read any of his <clears throat> books, he's got, a, he's got a couple. I've read a, a bunch and I've reviewed a few of them. Um, like this is, the, I think, the more, more recent one here, Art of Invisibility. Good no, book. I've read that one. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, write that one jot down Kevin Minnick. He, he's got probably uh, yeah, four I've, or five good I've books. I've heard of him, but I've just um, not. It's just difficult sometimes to keep up with yeah, visibility. Yeah. And, and I've presented with him and I've interviewed him a few times. Fascinating mind. I mean, now he, he was back in the days, he was a phone freaker hacking into different phone <laughs> systems along with. That was really Apple bizarre. Apple and others. So he's got some great history. He got to the point where he actually got in some trouble. I think he spent about three years 
in a federal prison as a result of some of his hacking escapades. But that was done by the dial tones, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. DTMF tones and a lot yeah. of analog and he would in, imitate it. And, and, and they claimed, I guess, in the one book I was reading, I guess it was Ghost in the Wires, I think it, it, it claimed yeah, that when he spent time that, yeah. in prison, he could imitate he could get, over the, the tones yeah, he could and get out. nuclear codes and different yeah. things. It's kind of funny. Yeah, it's, it's a brilliant story. The fact as well. Because again, he oh, could yeah. do. I think there was like a rumor that he could he was passing messages out and stuff yes. like that as well. And you know, if you've got a, a, th a skill like that, and you're going to jail, and you just oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next, next thing you've got a dialed out tone. It's it's so crazy. Like how how that system worked as well with dial up was bizarre. Yeah, like yeah. people today so wouldn't. Much. Yeah, they wouldn't even. Kids today wouldn't even know. Like it took you so long. Just to get on the internet so long it's like oh, yeah. i think on average it was four to seven minutes something like that like, at least <laughs> it was crazy the world the world has changed when, when i was a kid I, I had the privilege to grow up um and being a gamer i was also a hacker and i was pirating games and getting you know from people around the world trying to get the latest and greatest games on apple and atari my father happened to work at atari he was the VP That's of the lab. So, <laughs> and lucky for him and lucky for you. Yeah, so we did that for us as kids. Me and my brother, we had, we had a ball. We built some hardware that I would actually copy the actual uh, EPROMs, the actual hardware proms, the hard code from the Atari games. And we duplicate and we amassed, I don't know, it had to be close to 500 games that we copied and burned into cartridges. And we'd make our own labels for them. And try them and stuff. Yeah, we were bad, but it, it was a lot of fun back then. But to your point, it was, um, I remember the 110 baud acoustical modems back then. And, and it was really pre-internet days and it would be a, on the BBC or you'd have to connect in and be a system operator and get a passcode to get through. And we tried to hack through and start copying <laughs> games down once we got through and stay up all night. It was a lot of fun back then. That's brilliant. Let's yeah. talk about your uh, Blue Sleuth. Yeah, Blue, Blue Sleuth again, that, that, that's interesting. And we've, we've been selling a lot of Blue Sleuths to government agencies because Bluetooth has kind of now become a, an accepted standard everywhere. But yep. it's also been learned that uh, Bluetooth technology and Bluetooth low energy could also be used as a threat for communication or it could be used to trigger something. In particular, we sell to a lot of nuclear facilities around the globe. A lot of these sensors are tied to Bluetooth um, devices. So now imagine somebody Eek. comes with close enough Jeez. proximity to something Bluetooth and from your phone or another device, you want to change a sensor that maybe yeah, control yeah, yeah. the centrifuge. Well, could, and be anything, could be reactor. anything, couldn't it? <laughs> so, big threat. They're not allowed to have wireless inside of nuclear facilities. Things need to be kept intrinsically safe so they can't cause a spark or blow things up. So. A lot of our tools are used on the perimeter to stop and be early detection. So somebody's coming. So a blue sleuth, to your point, will be used. Security patrol will actually walk around to see if they see any Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy activity. And we actually have a database of known threats. So it could pop up on the screen. And now it's coupled to a direction finding antenna. So now you can actually steer like a Geiger counter and yeah, hone yeah. and say, ah, we found that source. Right, It's right over there. Let's unplug it, remove it so that threat is gone. So a lot of it's used for a little bit cloak and dagger, direction finding type stuff. Uh, we sell to a lot of spy agencies, private investigators for our tools for finding hidden GPS trackers, cheating spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, yeah. or catching the crazy guys and all that. Our tools, again, will be used to hone in and find where that hidden GPS tracker is pretty popular. So it's fun stuff because I get to hear the wacky stories. Stories as well. That, <laughs> the things that make movies. <laughs> We're doing that actual stuff yeah, yeah. with our tools, which is kind of, to me, it's kind of cool because it's cutting edge, but you also get to live through some of the problems and help people. Uh, we had a recent story. It was earlier this year. And it's a true story. You could look it up. It, it's, a, it's in the public news. We've been selling a product called our Wolfhound Pro, which is a cell phone detector coupled to a direction finding antenna up in the, um, the French Alps. There was a family walking along a huge, huge uh, snowstorm, which then okay. became an avalanche. Yep. And it came down, covered part of the village. And uh, the mother and the kids got away, but the father got trapped. Yep. He was against a tree, kind of hidden. He actually survived it. And how he survived it, they had 130 people in the town went over with those sticks trying to find him, couldn't find him. They brought uh, search dogs out, sniffed all the area. They walked all past the area where the avalanche couldn't find him again. 
Now it's about two and a half hours into it's getting a little bit scary because you know you can only survive with barely any air and you know whatever. Um, and then somebody says, wait, I got one of these things called a Wolfhound Pro from this company, Berkeley Viratronics. Can I try it? And they ran out there, search and rescue. And all of a sudden they got a ping on the screen. And I said, we picked up a cell phone. Go over here, start digging. They called everybody back. Guys, come back here. We got a ping of cell phone underneath. And it was, I think it was roughly two plus meters, almost 10 feet underneath of packed heavy snow. They dug down miraculously. They found the yeah, guy who's still alive. Long. Yeah, I and mean, he saved him, rushed him to the hospital. He had minor damage, I think a hip and some other things. But he walked out a few days later and actually survived. And uh, they, they kind of owed credit, thank you, to the to the Wallhound Pro for saving the guy's life. So we're really kind of excited about that because we sell to search and rescue teams around the world. And oftentimes we don't hear about the, the positive good results that come about from technology yeah. in this case it was few. kind of exciting you know <laughs> it's save a man's probably. life just by by the tools that you're designing and building and that to me is cool and another one is we have um a, a little product called the transit hound yeah, and I was uh, ask about that one as well yeah years ago there was a huge crash this was back in 2008 2009 um in, in los angeles and, and there was i think it was 28 to 30 people roughly um died as a result of it and the operator of the train was distracted. He looked down at his phone and went too fast to flip the train and all these people got killed. And it, it started to implement legislation to have laws where they have to have technology on trains to make sure operators are not using cell phones. So we were contacted by a, a major rail. We were working on it probably about four or five years, no success. And then suddenly one major uh, rail company, the biggest in the United States on the freight side, got interested and did a pilot and said, this is really cool technology. And what we did, we designed it so we could pick up any phone, cell phone or that's texting or making a phone call or searching on the internet. And it would trigger a camera and start a DVR. And then wirelessly, it would relay that back to headquarters and put it up ah. on the big screen. Now you could see Johnny operating the train yeah, texting yeah. instead of looking ahead and adjusting the speed. And suddenly they start to catch all these operators one after the next. And they would reprimand them or fire them, depending upon what it was. And That's I started so to realize, simple, isn't it? It, yeah, it's, it's, it's straightforward. It's simple, but nobody was really thinking of it. And we focused our energies there for four or five years just to perfect the cell phone detection engine. And that part that we, we did took off. We've now sold over 16,000 locomotives we're on. That's and amazing. It's growing and it's and now it's also we're, we're, we're looking at um, heavy machinery. We sold several thousand on the big giant scooper trucks. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, do you do it for like yeah. forklift trucks? Because oh, forklifts, yeah. they're yeah. notorious. Like... Oh, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and Just what we realized is millions of pounds everybody of is distracted. Everybody's, you know, looking well, down at their phone. That's, that's what I meant thing. by it being so simple. Yeah. It's just so simple to check your phone because it's just in front of you and you're like, well, I've done this. Yeah. Say for a forklift, I've done this corner a million times. Oh, my phone's going off. Let's have a quick look. Brr, oversteer. And next thing you've just smashed down oh. loads of racking. <laughs> and, and I've we've seen, seen some terrible ones. stuff to the roads even now. Recently, we created a product called the Roadhound. There's a trailer based solution, a pole mounted that's basically a sign. And we see drivers approaching it. We have radar and we have a detection zone and we have direction finding antennas. We pick up the transmission signal from their phone to the mobile tower. And we'll flash a sign. We put anything on it there, you know, hang up a drive dummy, whatever the case may be. And, and it, it's really taken off. We started selling a bunch of systems, but a lot of it is used for mines because mines, they've got million dollar dump trucks coming up the side of a, a mine where if they roll over, it could kill people, yeah, yeah. cost millions of dollars and damage huge, liability. Like when you talk about some of those mass, I mean, people that in the UK look at like, a, my son's a good example. He looks at a lorry and it's huge to him. Yeah, and I'm like, I've seen them all day, every day. But then if you go to a massive construction site and see like a huge digger or a crane, uh, well, that's still pretty big. But then when you go to America and you see some of their stuff, you're like, wow, that wheel's the size of my house. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. phenomenally big. Like you can't, you can't even put it to scale. You know, like some wild amount of tons that's just well even just tip, even just tipping it you're not going to just tip it upright and it would be a nightmare oh, yeah. you know well, one of the biggest itself. problems they have with those those big dump trucks they're so high up the wheels are so big and you're looking out this way 
and a small little pickup truck is driving there. You yeah. drive right over. You don't even know it. It's like no, you wouldn't even have. You wouldn't even have a clue. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> some of those you could probably drive over the monster trucks and barely even see them. Yeah. You know, exactly. Some of them are exactly. preposterous. Crazy. Oh, did da 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 da. Where is that? So uh, obviously you've got. Um, Again, it's very rare to speak to someone who's like uh, invented like things, and it's so so wild. Um, have you ever thought about putting them on drones? Some of your technology, um, yeah. especially sort of maybe the Bluetooth stuff, because you know, I mean, well, apart from the battery life of drones, you know, in terms of like military stuff, you could just have them zipping around. You wouldn't even have to see squat. You know, almost saves yet again on a secondary manpower. No, we, we've worked actually with um, somebody that integrated their drone experts. They actually built drones and designed them from the ground up and we partnered with them. They actually integrated some of our cell phone detection engines onto a drone and, and they, they work with a search and rescue group and they, and they patrol the Swiss Alps. So they actually yeah, yeah. their technology, they're flying over. And the part that's really cool, and they sent me video footage of this, they coupled it also with, with clear night scopes so they can actually look for the heat as well as cell phone detection. So now imagine somebody's hiking along and the Alps and they fall, they break a leg and they can't get to the next yeah. step. Maybe they got their phone on them, but they're passed out. And that phone will still ping autonomous registration from mobile to tower. We can fly over with that drone. We could pick up the heat detection maybe of their body, assuming that they're alive, hopefully, and the phone. And then we could also pick up the RF energy and now we could geocode, find out where they are, and then they could send in a focus rescue group and hopefully save them before they, they perish. So really cool stuff with using drones and technology. Uh, same thing around um, nuclear facilities. A lot of times now there's there's the converse, there's a threat of a drone. Uh, you could take C4, couple it to a drone, you could fly at very low velocity and you can get under radar. Under radar, yeah, yeah. And you can't tell, is it a bird, is it a drone, whatever. So it, it doesn't get caught and now you go into really the the power source if you don't have power and the backup for a nuclear reactor you can't keep it cool and that thing overheats and you got I've meltdown some, you got major problems drone drones that look like birds you know yeah, they yeah. look the, really the like birds yes. yeah you wouldn't yeah. even know you so think it was just a or something. technology <clears throat> we've done too we can actually pick up the address of the drone flying we can figure out and calculate what the altitude is and then we can also um shoot see it down the, the drone <laughs> is associated to the pilot with the remote control and and really hunt down the pilot to take out the drone threat yeah there's been some uh drones lately that people have stuck weapons to which is crazy i think one's like a flamethrower on it or something it was i think it was some some sort of joke but yeah, that's yeah. super scary Something yeah. swooping down out of the sky and launching napalm on you. It's, yeah, it's like a dragon. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it really is. <laughs> you know, it'd be bonkers. What's your thoughts on Neuralink? Because that's a lot of people that I've spoke to. I'm a huge fan of Neuralink um, just because of the, not only the benefits, but just because, again, a lot of people just can't talk properly and they struggle to relay information and, you know, people joke that the, the version seven of that is you're just going to be able to telepathically convey messages and the intent will be known rather than, you know, whatever. Um, but what's your thoughts on that? Because most people are like, well, what about you, people hacking into your brain or, you know, it's a very different sort of, I know it's a bit conspiracy ish, um, but it's almost a reality in a way. Yeah, I think we're starting to see it become a reality and it's, it's the not too distant future. Um, it's kind of eerie to me. It's kind of a little scary. It, it, it brings back memories. I spoke at RSA show with a, with a, a cybersecurity researcher. Actually, she worked for um, at the White House for a while, uh, Tyler Cohen Wood. And we actually talked about biometric hacking. And it was a fascinating concept. And we were trying to, to go to the limits of it and see what people, how they thought. Because we had a lot of researchers, cybersecurity researchers in the audience. And it was, it was interesting because at one point, a guy stands up and he goes, I have a biometric implant in my arm. And we started to interact and talk to him. And it was fascinating because he actually worked for the DOD. And we started to learn a lot about it, the, the good side and the bad side. And that's just something simple embedded under the skin. That's Department wireless. Department of Defense for those listeners out there. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Department <laughs> of Defense. No, sorry. Um, 
<laughs> and, and then we started to extrapolate and think out beyond that tapping into the mind and some of these other things. And it gave that kind of like feeling, uh, you know, chills up your spine. <laughs> How, how how then what could put what happen possibly in the future how people could be controlled and, and right away my mind started to think about and if you have you guys have ever watched the the movie was it i robot yeah yeah will smith in it yeah yeah those type of things start to conjure up in your mind and you say geez that the future is not too far off where we're going to see some of the technology interfacing with humans a lot more and i it always could be done good or bad better example yeah exactly I, because that's probably more. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I would guess that there would be parents out there that would go for that sort of. Hmm, sure. I've lost my child, or they can't conceive a child, and they go, "Okay, we can get like a." Well, they have like sex robots now, so you know yeah. they all you just strip away all that nonsense, turn it into sort of an emotional, um, you, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Like they, this, like they have support animals for people, don't they? You yeah. know, it's it's the same sort of principle. It would be like a support child i don't know that sounds a bit yeah. a bit creepy in itself but you could imagine but it happening coming. and yeah. then obviously the the implications from a cyber cyber security perspective trying to hack into somebody that's part man part machine whatever and what what that could be used for or for defense purposes and other things it just opens the possibilities for a lot of scary stuff so yeah, this way you can sort of talk about it's like magic, isn't it? In a way, you know, it's you just don't quite know where it can go. I mean, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm a skeptic of some things, but I also like to just occasionally delve down rabbit holes that, you know, are a bit conspirat conspiratorial and they're a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. But I like to make them a bit more fun, and I like to get them just so wild that they they are completely unbelievable. Um, but like I say, I'm a fan of Alex Jones. And the other day I was watching InfoWars and he was talking about nanotechnology mm. and it being used and applied to control animals. Now, I don't know how much of that's true, but that's, a, you know, almost on that same sort of, it's almost on the, behind the same fence, you know, and it's a, a project that has been going since 2007. And, and I'm, in my mind, I think you can accomplish quite a lot in five years. You know, oh, sure, sure. if you do just one singular person and you work towards, let's say, writing a book, you can do that in five years. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can do quite a lot. So I think in terms of 14 years with a whole bunch of scientists and everybody working on it and in, with modern day advances, it's hard to uh, say, are we cracking sort of codes like that? And because mm -hmm. we're looking at Neuralink and that, they, you know, they put it in that monkey and he was playing Pong with his mind and. That's almost the same thing. It's you don't know. It's very yeah. weird. It's, it's very weird. But obviously, again, it it does come under sort of a cyber security because it's again, if it's hackable, it should. Yeah. It should. Yeah. All these type of things, advances in technology can be exploited to some degree. And that's that's always the fear in the back of my mind. As these so much time and money and effort is put toward advances in technology, there's always an evil dark side that looks how can I exploit that to do wrongful things? And it's not always just to take money. A lot of times we think of people stealing money. Sometimes it's to cause chaos, disruption, change a political party's view, um, sow seeds of doubt in people's minds. Sometimes it's just for ego boosting. A lot of the hackers, yeah, just they, just want, they, go, they want an ego. Look, look who I hacked or what I did. And they want to sit back and take credit for it. Um, so it, it's a very different motivator now, which makes it hard to fight uh, the world of evil, because you don't exactly know where it's coming from. But usually what I tell people is to fight a hacker, to fight a cyber criminal, you have to kind of get into their mind and think like them a little bit. You have to be a little devious. Yep. You have to be willing to kind of push the envelope between what's right and wrong so you can catch them in the act and, and shut them down. It's like so, Kevin in Home Alone. You had yeah. to uh, sink to the burglar's levels. Exactly. Exactly. To rob the house. He had to lay some traps. Otherwise, yep. they'd have robbed him. Well, who knows how that would have ended? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the man, you know, it could have ended anyway. Scary prospect on Home Alone, though. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so very true. You know, that in, that was security in itself. He was secure in that household. He did a damn good job. Yeah. Did such a good job that it, it, it got several sequels, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your thoughts on, um, I don't know if you know much about like the new hypersonics that are coming out. Um, you know, you spoke about like drones. 
Um, hypersonic missiles are apparently the latest and, and, and greatest creation. Um, you know, I'm not a huge... I don't contain all the information in the world about these things. I just tend to pick little bits up and look yeah. into it. But then I, I look into so much that sometimes if it's if I'm not doing it there and then, and I'll give it a day or so, some of it gets over overtaken by crap. <laughs> let's, put, <laughs> let's put it to, you know. Um, but and what, that, what are these? These are like... Uh remote control missiles that are yeah, fast that you can they're, they're, someone on Yeah, and... they was basically really? saying that they can just go under radar, but they're that fast that the radar can barely pick them up by the time they've been fired. So in yeah. terms of security, that's extremely difficult to... Uh, it's tough to counter. To counter, like that. yeah. that's yeah. it's. I think America said, well, we've got this whatever it was. I don't even know what the system was. I didn't look into it. Um, this is where I sit. I, this is where I come up with jokes and say, yeah, we've got some sort of huge thing in the sky. And it just occasionally they have to turn it on and it'll just go. Yeah. And this huge, laser. huge 80 yeah. mile laser, laser will come flying out the sky. And there'll be, it won't, we don't need to worry about the hypersonics. <laughs> <clears throat> Obviously that doesn't exist. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> off the record does yeah, yeah off the off the record <laughs> depends which president you talk to <laughs> what's your thought well i mean like what do you think about president trump and, and, and his election i don't really talk I'm, i don't really like to talk about it much but obviously there's a lot of talking about it being rigged and you know again it comes under the cyber security umbrella because people were saying it was rigged and hacked and i mean you don't know nobody knows but yeah, I, I, I did a, 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 a fair amount of research, talked to a lot of parties. I did a few actual interviews on Fox uh, talking about it during his first election. Uh, it was back 2016. Um, and, and it was interesting. And I did prior to that, I actually had the privilege of uh, meeting President Trump before. He wow. Was, when he was what a, was that like? A TV. So it was actually very interesting. I actually yeah. was on I was in the guest uh, a guest in the audience of the final episode of The Apprentice, the Apprentice. show that he was on. And Brilliant. then I went to Trump Towers. They had an after uh, after show, the finale, a party. So I was there for, for a number of hours and got to just hang out with him, the family, and, and all these celebrities, which was kind of weird. I felt like a little bit of an oddball there, but I had a great time because it was so much fun <laughs> just to meet all these different people and, uh, and interact with them. And, and honestly, he was from a, a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, when he walked into the Trump Towers, I just happened to be standing there. I, I turned around and almost bumped into him. And I just said, hey, congratulations <laughs> on the finale of the show. Oh, love being there. Thanks for having me on as a guest. And he said, yes, it was a was a very good show. It was a very good show. Thank you for coming. Enjoy yourself tonight. And we we chatted, just small talk, took a few pictures, um, but very personable, very likable from a yeah, business yeah. standpoint. I think from the world of politics, he, to me, he just, and again, I'm not a, the world of politics I try to avoid and stay out of, but he seems like a misfit. It's almost like taking a business leader, putting him into a different world, and he's yeah, operating yeah. by different rules. It's who you know and <clears throat> who you've met 50 years ago and needles. He focuses on that on his presidency, which I think was very different. And I think most Americans, it, it caused that a little bit of a dividing line. Half of the country is so sick of po politicians, they probably gravitated to anybody, yeah, anybody yeah. that's not a politician. The other side said no. So it'll be interesting in a couple of years if he does run for re-election because he'll probably, everything is being undone that he did will now be redone. I redone, guess. yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of him. Um, I, not in terms of the way that kind of he tweeted or anything like that, but in terms of, the, the, he did a little bit of good for that country you know your yeah, country I, I, there's no sort of deny it, sorry yeah um even from a, a complete i mean i could be wrong because i don't live there but from an outsider standpoint i mean i watch i mean i really tune into america more than i do the uk hmm. uh, because this is just nonsense most of the time it's all the same reverberating story and then occasionally the royals will get involved that's it it's like okay cool you know Whereas at least over there is, you know, you get, you got Donald Trump and you've got all these crazy wacky politicians and characters and oh, it, you, yeah. we, we don't really have that over here apart from Piers Morgan. You know, that's about no, the only, yeah, the most of it. <laughs> yeah, you know, but 
Yeah. I was a fan of some of the stuff he did. It was the interesting but, part is the fact that with him, it, it, it crisscrossed. Here you got somebody in the business who's also got a TV persona that gets into politics. And then for my world, cybersecurity comes in. It's like the perfect storm of just total chaos. And it, it's almost like a comedy show, some of the things that went on there. And, and I, was, I was actually contacted during the elections multiple times from different Russian news organizations wow. being asked to weigh in on it. And they would provide some of the research that was... Okay. <laughs> modified so it looked like things against the united states and i just said i said i don't get involved in politics i'm sorry i can't you know report on this i can't commentate on it i'm sorry Smart i have to move. deny i just yeah, yeah. kept it kept it over there and said i have no opinion thank you and i'll stick that's to why it. you should just claim that you're a podcast host Going off, exactly you must have me confused with somebody else no i'm a, a host Podcaster. of a podcast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just so happens to share the same name we look a bit similar just, exactly just get some uh, bleach tips when you, you speak to them and make sure you do it on camera just get like a That's fake it, yeah. a fake get up and just go no no i'm the podcast host You've, you know you you can see me just that'd be my plan anyway uh, yeah, it, works, it's, yeah. it was a it was a very good move to i, I probably wouldn't have t t taken that being in your position um yeah, you just don't even know what you, you yeah you do you well i mean it'd be it's so weird to negotiate, you know, it's good media. And a lot of I've learned over the years, media is definitely manipulated and it's mis misreported on many stories. They'll report on this much of it, which will look kind of yeah. steer you down this path to believe something that's not there. And it may be truths in the statements, but it's not overall truthful because your conclusion is not correct. And, and that's what happens often. It's, you got to be very careful. Very Cancel careful. cultures are a little bit like that at the minute as they'll just take, you know, a, a segment of it happens to Joe Rogan quite a lot. He's probably the the easiest person to put out there for that is, you know, they'll take like a minute of his three hour show and then that's mm -hmm. it. That's who he is, you know, so yep. people are doing it to everybody. It's weird. Yeah, it's, it's, weird, it's like strange a strange world it, at the minute took your podcast and they took a clip of where I said, Trump is a really nice guy. And they said, look, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> edit it out and say, wow, yeah, Scott's a Trump supporter and this and that. And say, oh. a, yeah, I talk wild stuff all the time. So I probably wouldn't be worried about you. It's when they go back into mine and go, wait a minute, we'll save this for future use. Never mind that. We'll just save this. Yeah. I, I, I must compromise myself every show just with <laughs> kind of jokes and unpopular opinions. But um I think you kind of kind of got to be yourself nowadays and not conform yeah. to the world and no, that's what I was uh, otherwise you're not even really living you don't even really live your life you know you're, yeah. you're almost in the back seat of wow well, the narrative of life <laughs> it's not but you're being fed anyway it's you know it's pretty weird it's such a strange one let's talk about your podcast um because again you're a man of many talents Again, we're like an hourish. I know you're probably a busy man, so I won't take up uh, your whole morning. Yeah, so let's talk talk a little bit about your show. Do you mind if I smoke? Is that okay? No, no, no. Cool, cool. First person I've asked that, by the way. I normally don't ask. I'm normally like, oh yeah, and I'll just forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. But but today I'll, I've asked. I've been polite, people. There you go. Um, I, podcasting, I think it's really cool because again, my background from the stuff I've been doing for the past decade plus has all been radio. Uh, television, public speaking, podcasts, the nice part about it, I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate it, is you, you, you have usually a micro audience that you can connect with. And in, in yep. this case, my show is What Keeps You Up at Night. And, mm -hmm. and the, really the whole genesis of it was, I, I thought it would be interesting to interview people that are kind of cyber-like minded, trying to keep people safe, uh, yet they deep down have fears and apprehensions and it'd be neat to kind of get inside their brain for a minute and just think about and understand what makes them really worry. What's the next threat that they're thinking about that kind of scares the crap out of them and keeps them up at sleepless nights. Yeah. They realize there's no exact solution. And I got some really great feedback from, from some, some cool people, I think. And a lot of, a lot of the guests surprisingly came up with some, some interesting things that just afterwards I look back and reflect on, I say, wow, just like those things don't even cross my mind and yet they're, they're diving into this. This is really cool stuff. And um, I think that's important to kind of get different perspectives 
on things. And it's, it's, for me, it's a teaching moment. I learn myself. And I think hopefully the, the viewers can also learn from it. And it's a short format. I try to keep it it's five to 10 minutes or so. Um, and that way it, it's a That's light, very younger people. Yeah. Loose com conversation. And um, it really gives them kind of control of the mic. It lets them speak and, uh, and just share some of their fears. And uh, it, it's neat because I'm usually focused on problem solution. In this case, we're really just discussing some of the problems and the fears. We're not really tackling it by saying, well, the way to combat, you know, hacking into IoT is boom, boom, boom. Yeah. But rather it's just sharing their fear side of it. And it le really lets the audience kind of think about the future and say, geez, these are actual real problems that are keeping cybersecurity researchers up at night. What can they do and bring to the community to maybe help and solve some of these problems? So it, it, it's a fun little segment that I do. Um, I'm working on another one too. I, th I think um, it's gonna come to fruition. My, my partner, my brother, he's out on the West Coast in LA. I'm here on the East Coast, right outside of, of New York. And we wanted to do kind of a coast to coast cyber show uh, where we kind of, cool contrast not just you got partners in a business you've got brothers and then you've got cybersecurity concepts and, and culture so we we clash in some ways and we complement in other ways good so. names for that show yeah so it could could be coast kind to of, coast brothers yeah. uh, some, you get some really good could be some really cool names for that sounds yeah. sounds a really good project yeah it sounds, um, sounds it'll be fun and he's also my brother's been on the radio he had a live show when he was in brooklyn for a number of years so He's, he's got a good ability to handle subjects and and also sometimes it could be a, a, a 180 opposite of my opinion. So, and that makes for good conversation. <laughs> so so I'm, I feel like very banter. passionate about this, but yet over here, he'll counter it and say, well, that's a great point, Scott, but you're dead wrong. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> so people, you're like, dead wrong. <laughs> it'll be a little bit of a, of a cyber battle back and forth. as we It's brilliant. Technology and other things. I've also been... Um, getting getting into radio i'm on cybercrime radio now and it, it's a show that was just recently launched it, it actually runs 24 7 seven days a week 365 days and i do a, a live piece in fact right after this i'm going to do a live segment and then air, every hour it'll air that piece throughout the oh, 24 cool. hours tomorrow's and, and i just basically cover the headlines and then the weekend i do a wrap-up so saturday sunday is basically me hitting the the five days what the, the cyber headlines are and they're short segments these are under two minute clips which are kind of cool and then i'm also doing i did a radio program where it's a weekly episode and that's kept it about five minutes or so and it's three cyber questions that they throw at me okay. that i provide insight on and tips and things like that so it's kind of neat to be able to span different media platforms being on tv a lot but but then doing podcasts, I do probably one or two podcasts a week. Great shows like this, where I'm reaching a lot of different audiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think well, this was another reason why I wanted to try and get you on as well, because you're an yeah. extremely knowledgeable guy. You're, a, you know, you've you've got so many different paths of life, uh, and it all it all like I say, it all falls under the same umbrella. But yeah. Yeah. it's your opinions are very good, uh, and I know a, a lot of my regular listeners are going to like this show. Yeah. Like really like it. Um, even though I've not put no conspiracies in there, we'll, uh, it'll be okay. <laughs> there's, there's normally a few, um, or normally all. <laughs> but... in, in podcasts, I think, do that too. It's a nice, intimate conversation you can have with somebody. And, and experienced hosts like yourself can actually draw people out. And I think that's what's really important with podcasting. It's not just rambling and talking that are cut off every few minutes by commercials as radio is yeah it's, it's a focused conversation and then if it's if it's videotaped two people can watch it they can listen to it later they're on a jog they're in the car commuting they can kind of really concentrate and pick up little tidbits just to make their life better make their life safer in the case of cybersecurity, hopefully so i think it's it's, it's a great format before we wrap up the show yeah. <clears throat> um, and this will be the only mild conspiracy just because it it does fall under cyber security so we all know about john mcafee how yeah. do you want to how do you pronounce his last name is it yeah, mcafee mcafee, McAfee yep. it is i've been pronouncing it right the whole time thinking it's, it's mcafee so that's fine um obviously he's a notorious guy he does you know but there's a lot in the news about him at the moment um, and I, the circles that I'm in, they talk quite a lot of bollocks and shit. 
excuse my language there, but the, the recent thing is that 31 terabytes of information that he has on a dead man switch set to, well, it's been released, there was a little countdown, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and now people are basically, there's like a, um, a password for it and people are all sitting there trying to guess it and get into it. And I'm, I'm sitting here watching from the background like it's a soap opera. like, And it's, it's quite genius because I don't know whether it's all bullshit or whether it's a real thing. But coming from someone who is in that game, what do you think? Because it's, it's a very strange thing. But so many people are bought into it. You know, there was all the memes and the t tweets. And... Oh, yeah. yeah. His life is a, a, a complicated mess, in my opinion. <laughs> I've read about it a lot. It, it's kind of fascinating. But, but I liken it to maybe watching a train wreck. You, you can't not watch it. A train wreck. It's, it, it's like just like, oh, I can't believe he said that. He did that. Is this true? Is it not true? Now, now ironically, I also work um, with Cybersecurity Ventures, who does the uh, cybercrime radio that I'm on. They actually own the life story, the biography of John McAfee. And he was <laughs> part of um, the advisory board for their company so he actually had multiple there were multiple sit-down interviews that are documented and they're actually released especially since his passing or presumed passing and yeah, uh, <laughs> presumed. <laughs> yeah really interesting reading but if, if you go to cyber a uh, 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 cyber cyber crime magazine or cybersecurity ventures.com and look up john mcafee it's right there on the, on the cover and you can actually read some of the personal stories uh, over the past few years where there were sit down interviews with him and it's stuff that the other media doesn't even have. So it's actually true because it's, yeah. it's real sit down interviews with them and it's very candid. And I think it's pretty fascinating. If anybody gets a chance, check it out. Um, I've been reading some of them and just cracking up. And of course I watch some documentaries and YouTubes and try to follow a little bit because his background in the world of cybersecurity is pretty fascinating. And it's I, so bizarre. Yeah, I've had the privilege of interviewing some of the um, prior um, uh, uh, CEOs after that followed in the footsteps of McAfee, like David DeWalt is kind of an interesting yep. uh, character. Um, and a lot of my crisscross and I see at RSA or I'm going to Black Hat next week and different hacking shows and, and cybersecurity forums. So I get to, to meet a lot of these leaders and sit down, have one-to-ones and interview them and stuff. And it's fascinating, but everybody says the same thing. If you mention John McAfee, they all kind of like cringe mm. a little bit and they, they have to distance themselves. Like to the, the, the credibility is, is just not there. And uh, especially I think once he, to me, once he dove into the world of cryptocurrency <laughs> and he started, he started uh, pushing so many different crypto coins <laughs> lost a lot of money and he started evading taxes and yeah. it just, it just turned into a basket case of problems when you've got people multiple people are still buying them <laughs> i think the one people are still buying them there's that one that he yeah. got like as a tattoo that whacked or whatever it was that w h yeah. a c whatever it is and yeah. uh obviously people were always looking on i look on reddit a lot yeah because you know it's just fun and this is where you get a, a lot of all this crap from and uh, people are still buying those tokens. Oh, and it's still yeah. a tradable it, it, coin. And well, it, where's the it, money It gets go? a following. I think yeah. he's got a loyal following. And it is a little bit like a soap opera. I, I like it a little bit to what you brought up earlier about Trump. Some people um, like to follow the headlines in the news because it's, it's like you can't believe what he will say next. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think if... if Trump and McAfee were like brothers or something. It'd be <laughs> <laughs> that's the next one. Yeah. That's what it is. It's thirty-one terabytes of their childhood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not even. <laughs> I mean, but obviously, there's, the cons there's a lot of conspiracies about it. We don't really need to get into them, but uh, it's just it's just, just such a strange guy, and you know, there's. there's but with what he did and what he does, you know, you, you you can only speculate, but that speculation can just get so wild. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, it is very know. crazy. I, I liked I was doing some reading about him, actually, and really more the backstory that he was with a buddy. And, and, and I guess they kind of discovered and this was back in, I guess, the early 90s. There was a virus on a computer and they saw the damage or the potential damage if somebody created this thing and put it on someone else's computer it could be 
really affect the computer industry. So he actually hired a programmer to pro program something to, um, to stop and catch the virus. And that concept really took off, which formed his company. Ah. I, I thought that was fascinating. The fact that even I always thought he was the author or the coder that actually wrote yeah, the virus that's, software. He that's what I thought. He saw a really <clears throat> cool idea and he stuffed <laughs> it up and hired someone else. And he it's made a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> done, a, done a Ray Kroc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so all those entrepreneurs that are listening and watching, sometimes you have a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, the execution on the idea is important. Just make sure that you protect yourself and hire out the right party to develop that idea, so you could take it to fruition and and make a business model out of it. He obviously stepped in it really good in more than one way. So he, uh, he did some interesting things. One of the most notorious viruses was back in the day was just the Trojan virus and. Yeah. You know, you, you get like that Win Win Thirty Two blue screen, and you just no, green of death. So you, yeah, you just oh. I mean, when I was growing up, again, this was it was re really popular, and unfortunately, my, my my dad had a warehouse, and it was all there was like four or five computers, it was all in the oh. same system, and well, a few times, you know, and again, he owned like a multi million multi million pound gym equipment company for ma oh, manufacturing wow. and. Well, let's just say a couple of times production got halted because of me. Rubbish games, or whatever it could have been, yeah. you know. But this was just back in the day. I could it could have been anything, yeah. probably well, like well, now porn. Now, being how young I was to, today, modern day, what do we see? Ransomware. Ransomware has now really actually impacted not just somebody's home computer or a small business. Now you're talking about halting infrastructure and, and threatening lives at hospitals or other things like that. To me, it's taken it now to another whole level where they're trying to start. I think the record so far is a, a, a $40 million US payout in ransomware to an undisclosed company through an insurance company, which, wow. which is kind of scary. That's what they're settling on. So they may start out with a hundred million dollar ransom and they settle, well, we'll pay you 40 million in Bitcoin or something. Yeah, in, in Bitcoin. <laughs> That's a <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if that's what they're using as ransom currency. Yeah, that's if what it is. Because you'd still, yeah, you'd yeah, you'd still accept it. There's no yep. reason why people don't think this is a problem. People go, well, it's the people's currency. Yeah, but who runs the government? It's people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, you know, D Donald Trump's probably got X amount of bitcoins himself. Yeah. <laughs> why wouldn't he? The yeah. dude's a G is 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 a businessman. He's probably yeah. got all of them probably got multitudes of it's probably got one of each yeah probably go well it'd be a good good decision we'll just get one of each hedge your hedge bets, bets. A little everything. yeah that's what it is is hedge oh, your bets yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right i think that's true yeah, no. that, that's why i think wealthy people if you really analyze anybody that these these mega super rich people they actually diversify or told to diversify they wouldn't do anything probably but they get these investors to say diversify buy every cryptocurrency, buy every one of these. And all they're, they're looking for is the one in a hundred that actually yep. takes off. That exceeds the value of ever, everything. And that's all you're looking for oftentimes when you invest. Um, and, and just the, all the other stuff you write off and, and that you know offsets some of the gains and you still come out super rich. And, and they, money makes money. And that's how they do it oftentimes, diversifying. <clears throat> See, it's, it's, such a, it's such a strange one. Uh, do you know much about, um, again, this... Some, I wouldn't know if it's a conspiracy. I only briefly heard about it. Uh, several, was it last week? Might have been last week. Apparently some huge attack happened to some servers. Um, but it was like a main like server line or something like that. It wasn't this, uh, a... Kaseya maybe? Where they targeted like about 1,500 computers. Yeah. Was, cyber attack and then ransomware. Yeah, there was big, a big huge... Mess. Huge big thing. I think it was last week. Yeah, um, probably could say. Not, I think we got any information on that because I only briefly heard about it like secondhand, and I didn't really get to hear much apart from the the huge amount of things and servers that it got into. And some of those were big companies, and it was like, whoa! Yeah, I but I only got thirty seconds is, of it. A lot of these these breaches, as of recently, that one and other ones. It, it's one large company that has access or arms to other companies because they provide software and a lot of it's remote access. So if okay. you target a company that has remote access and branches into hundreds or thousands of other companies, 
that's how cyber criminals will work in. They'll, they'll typically access it through, usually it's a, it's a, a VPN with maybe a, a weak password and not using multi-factor authentication as a remote login, pretend they're an employee, and now they get in there and they start collecting masses of data. And uh, I've noticed a, a, a something interesting that's happening in a lot of these cases. These cyber criminals, they'll go into a system, they'll spend some time in there, a week, a month, whatever, and they'll just collect everything, almost like a mass of all the data. They'll hold that. Then they'll do is encrypt everything and they'll, they'll perform a ransomware attack on a particular company or all the companies that they've got these spider leg connections to. Yeah. And then when they start getting payments in and everything gets quiet and they make a lot of money and then other companies are holdouts, now they take this mass of data that they have and say, we're going to go out on the dark web and we're going to sell this to the higher bidder if you don't pay ransom. So they kind of go back for round two. But the ask is not thousands of dollars or a couple of bitcoins. The ask is ludicrous amounts of money because they look at what, what the IP is, what the personal information is, and say, geez, we can get a $50 million. We can get $100 million in bitcoins. Let's ask for the sky. And that's what they do. Yeah. And then these insurance companies will come in who actually have repositories of bitcoins so they could respond. They're going to go in and try to negotiate it down, pay to get that decryption key to unlock it. In the case of, I think, what happened last week with Kaseya, um, they had somebody came forward with a decryption key and was able to unlock the encrypted data and restore companies. And now what they did was they contacted all of those close to 1,500 companies that had that exact same encryption algorithm implemented on their systems and slowly were able to decrypt them all before they, they had to pay the, uh, the, the ransomware. And, and it was added insult to injury because the cyber criminal gang that performed or orchestrated, I think it was called the Dark, Dark Shadow, um, they actually went down. So now you had nobody that you can actually go back to and negotiate with at a certain point because they were shut down. But mysteriously, nobody knows who shut them down. Was it the U.S. government? The U.S. government reached out to Putin over in Russia and said, hey, enough is enough. We, we traced this down and realized these are organized Russian cyber criminals behind this. We know you're not necessarily doing it directly, but you know who is doing it. Shut them down or else. And now suddenly, mysteriously, they shut down. So perhaps the Biden administration strong armed Putin a little bit and he backed off and said, OK, guys, they're, they're catching up. They're realizing that we're kind of uh, working with these cyber criminals. We got to stop this or else they're going to take some drastic action here. And I think that's how it's kind of unfolding in this latest round of it. Very confusing because so many companies and cyber criminals are now yeah, crisscrossing yeah, yeah. a lot of the code and the scripts that they're using in these ransomware attacks. It, it's actually code that's reused but written. And what they'll actually do is put in some of the actual code lines of some of the stuff from China. They'll slip in some stuff from Romania. Right. So, when yeah, yeah. It, so when you're doing post cyber breach, and you're doing forensics, you start analyzing the code. You're like, wait a minute. This yeah, looks like it's from Russia. Oh, wait, maybe it's from Romania. Oh, wait, nobody's from China. Oh, wait, this is from somebody in the U.S. They can't really it's put like their fingers on it. An advanced form of mailing things. Yeah. So, like, I go, hey, let's send this to America, but I, let's put it through France first. Yeah. Let's, you know, or what? let's say I'm sending drugs. I go, well, I can't do it direct. We'll send mm -hmm. it to this person. This person is, it's like an advanced version of that, it seems. Exactly. Yeah. So, so cyber criminals are really smart and they're getting smarter. Um, usually the, 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 their problem is their egos. When they perform these great cyber attacks, they're so <laughs> proud of it, they start bragging about it on social media. And that's often how they get caught. The, the FBI has hundreds of agents in the U.S. that are actually posing as hackers. And, oh, it wouldn't oh, surprise me. Just to fool them, to lure them in. And, yeah, yeah. and it works. It really does work. It's very effective means to, to fool cyber criminals because well, they, they play on their ego and they catch them. We'll even hire them as well. There was a yeah. guy years and years ago who hacked into NASA, I think, and like he got a little bit of information and then he only managed to download X amount of it because this was way back when. But I'm pretty sure they gave him a job. Yeah. Like... They shut him down completely, but then psh, poof, yep. and it's happened to so many people, uh, you right. know, where they just go, you, you know, you just got into us. <laughs> like, 
we want to hire you before someone else probably does. And, and that's exactly you know? what happens. They become a white hat hacker. They're doing things for ethical purposes. Yeah, yeah. And, and they make sure that they pay them um, a lot more. better than. They <laughs> yeah, yeah. That negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> that that has to be worthwhile yeah. you go well i could get all your details now yeah. you, you know i got nasa yeah, yeah i want three generations yeah. at least <laughs> in gold i don't even want it in cash i want it in the gold reserve i don't want bitcoin <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, don't, I don't want bitcoin i don't even ethereum again yeah. oh no well, that's doing quite well. Well, anyway, we'll uh, we'll round this up properly. I've said that twice. Yeah. Where can people follow you before we uh, quit the show? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to uh, connect with anybody. They can reach out to me on my website, scottshober.com. And uh, if you put the little thing in through the, the email chat on there, it's actually me that responds. And I get hundreds of people that will send me stuff, uh, you know, the the love and the hate mail and everything else in between. Uh, but if you do have questions, I actually do respond to them. And I try to have my, my best to help answer the questions or find the answer and get back to you or steer you in the right direction if you're asking for recommendations. A lot of people like to know, hey, what password manager do you recommend? Or what do you personally like here or there? So I try not to endorse anybody, but I'm happy to, to give them personal yeah, yeah. what I found to be helpful um, for, for what that's worth. And of course, I'm on all the the social media platforms on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm on Twitter and so on and so forth. And feel free to, to follow along my uh, little podcast series there. What keeps you up at night? And I love the feedback. I love it when I hear people comment on it or put up something in YouTube there and what you liked or disliked about it. It, it, it helps me to improve hopefully as a host and uh, i really appreciate the time having me on here and nice conversation no, so much absolutely been brilliant i mean normally it gets a bit wild and we'll talk talk some conspiracies and i'll have a few beers flowing but i <laughs> didn't want that to be the case this time yeah. um maybe the next show i'd love to have you on again um, yeah, maybe I, love to, it. I don't want to compromise you ruin your career just maybe to just talk talk a bit of wild stuff and yeah. i wanted to get a bit into like ai and things like that but absolutely. i really didn't want to I really didn't want to take up too much of your time because you're a way busier man than me. Yeah, uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not out here inventing things. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I've not. I've just got a podcast. I'm not writing books. Yeah. You know, I don't. I'm not a president of a company. So people that you know have not much time. I do appreciate it. Um, and Absolutely. people need R and R time as well, especially yeah. when they're super busy. Um, so no great, know. greatly appreciate. I'll, I'll pull out a glass of scotch next time. We'll have a really interesting. Oh, time. absolutely. Okay. Um, well, normally I'll I'll drink cans, but occasionally I'll get some scotch, a bit there of whiskey. So we'll do that. Maybe a bit of bourbon. Bourbon's my uh, drink okay. of choice at the moment. Um, but no, well, listen, this has been an absolutely perfect show. Okay. It's been lovely to have you on. Uh, Scott Schober, ladies and gentlemen, I'll put the clap in myself that time. All right. uh, take it easy. Uh, it's been the Postman Podcast. And I'll catch you next time, people. Thank you very much. Take care.